um, and I know that many of you were blessed by him. Somebody we were leaving last week said, well, you're going to have a hard act to follow. Like, I didn't already know that. Thank you very much. But we are returning uh, today to the book of Revelation and to the last of these seven churches that Jesus addresses. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to Revelation chapter 3. Not a hard book to find. And we're going to go ahead and start at verse 14 and read through the end of the chapter. So Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You may recall that when we looked at the church in Philadelphia, which is the church that immediately precedes the one that we're looking at today, that Jesus had set before that church in Philadelphia what? An open door. An open door for salvation, an open door for service, and an open door for evangelism. And one of the things that was so remarkable about that church is that even though it was small, even though it was a persecuted church, these people nevertheless walked through that open door. They embraced the opportunity that was before them enthusiastically. Well, we come now to the last of these seven letters, the church in Laodicea, and what we discover is that there is another door here as well. But this time it is a closed door. Jesus is standing on the outside, he says, and knocking, hoping that someone will hear his voice and someone will let him in. It is a very different picture than the one we had in Philadelphia. Hmm. Well, let's see. Technology is a terrible thing some days. It's a closed door. Yes, <laughs> the computer. There was a group of artists that operated at the end of the 19th century in England. Uh, they became known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Um, they were a remarkable group of artists. They were deeply concerned about what they considered to be the trivial pursuits in the arts, uh, particularly in terms of painting and sculpture and poetry. And what they wanted to do was to go back before the age of Raphael. They blamed Raphael for all of the problems in art that, that came from his time period right up to their own time period. And the belief was that it's not that great artists didn't exist, but that great artists were not pursuing the really lofty things that art was meant to depict. Uh, in antiquity, people would pick, depict great scenes of, of courage and heroism, maybe from pagan um, myths and so forth, but nevertheless, they, they were pieces of artwork that were meant to teach a message. And then, of course, during the Christian era, what they would do is they would adopt images that were out of the Bible, images of the fall or images of redemption or images of Jesus at work. And, but they said with Raphael, Raphael began to go off and paint other things that weren't as lofty. Uh, they were very critical of landscape artists, for example, which they thought, you know, what, what, how can you possibly improve upon God's own creation? Uh, you shouldn't be painting that sort of thing. They particularly disliked um, artists who painted portraits, which they thought was sort of like our selfie culture today. Who in the world wants to have a portrait of themselves? They thought that was beneath 
the artist. And so their real desire was to sort of bring back the great themes of artwork at the end of the 19th century. Now, many people have referred to them as sentimental, and in some respects they were. But they nevertheless produced some amazing works of art. They were serious artists, sculptors, and poets. And the leader of this band, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, was a man by the name of William Holman Hunt. And Hunt spent a number of months in the Holy Land uh, painting pictures and being inspired. Uh, you can still see his paintings there in a number of the museums in Britain. But his most famous work uh, hangs in St. Paul's Cathedral. And the painting is entitled, The Light of the World. And you've probably seen it. There's a copy of it, incidentally, at Keble College, Oxford University. Uh, the painting is a magnificent painting. It's huge. It's oftentimes used as an evangelistic tool. You see Jesus, and he is doing what? He is standing on the outside. He is knocking on a door. The door is covered with vines and tendrils. You can't see it well in this picture, but there is no handle on the outside. The handle is on the inside. Jesus is clothed in priestly robes because he is the great victim. He is holding a lamp in his hand, which represents that he is the light of the world. And he is wearing a crown. If you look closely, it is a crown of thorns which has blossomed and is now bearing green leaves. He is the one who died and rose again. There's a great deal of symbolism in these paintings done by the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And this is a great example of it. I bring it to your attention, and we're going to come back to it at the end of today's lecture, but I bring it to your attention today because it comes out of this picture here in Revelation chapter 4. It comes from these verses, verse 20 and following. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. That's where the painting comes from. Oftentimes it's a picture of Jesus knocking on the door of the heart, we say. But that's not actually what this is about. The picture that we have here in Revelation, where this whole image comes from, is not Jesus knocking on the door of the unbeliever's heart. In the case of the church in Laodicea, it's Jesus knocking on the door of a Christian fellowship that has closed him out. And refused him entrance into the place where his so-called people dwell. That's the picture here. We've been talking about all of these churches, and we've been talking about the marks of a true church. And we said what's amazing is that Jesus, even though he has some criticism of some of these churches here in Revelation, he always has something good to say about most of these churches. He said that Ephesus was a church that was alive. Their problem, of course, was that they had refused to maintain their first love. They were doing all the right things, but they were doing them for all the wrong reasons. But nevertheless, Jesus had a word of encouragement for that church in Ephesus. The church in Smyrna, we said, was one of the unique churches here that Jesus speaks to because it is a church about which he has nothing negative to say. Now, that is very unusual, but there are only two churches like that, but this is one of them. This was a church that was faithful, and it was enduring suffering as a consequence of that fidelity. The third church was Pergamum. This was a church that needed to choose truth over error, and they needed to exercise godly discipline. In the case of Thyatira, the problem was righteousness over evil. Many of them had fallen into pagan practices, sexual immorality, and so forth, and Jesus was calling them back. In the case of Philadelphia, Jesus had set before them, we said, an opportunity, an open door, and this was a church that had stepped through and seized that opportunity. Now we come to Laodicea, and Laodicea is unique because of all the churches to which Jesus speaks, this is the only one about which he has absolutely nothing good to say. Nothing. Now he had some complaints about some of the other churches, but he also had some good things to say to them. There is nothing here to be said good about the church in Laodicea. It was wholehearted complacency. Wholehearted complacency, and that was the problem. 
Well, as we've done in the past, let's take a look at what the city and the church were like, this church of Laodicea, because they were real churches in real places. The city of Laodicea had been founded by the Seleucid king Antiochus II in the year 250 B.C. It was named for his wife Laodicea. It was referred to as Laodicea on the Lycus because there were actually six Laodiceas in the ancient world. But this was by far the most famous. You've all heard the expression location, location, location. We all recognize that that is true when you're buying a house. It was also true in terms of this city. It was located in a fertile valley. It was on a number of the main trade routes. In fact, there were three major Roman highways that intersected there near Laodicea, which meant that it was strategically located. It was strategically located, and as we're going to see, would become a major commercial center in the ancient world. It did, however, have one serious handicap, and this is helpful in terms of understanding what Jesus says to the church. Its serious handicap was that it did not have a supply of fresh water. Now, there were hot springs located by, but the water was not potable. And so fresh water had to be brought in via aqueduct from six miles away from a town called Denisius. Uh, those of you who have been with me to the Holy Land, to Caesarea Maritima, you've actually seen one of those Roman aqueducts. They are extraordinary. But fresh water was brought from Denisia six miles away the whole way to Laodicea so that this city could survive. The problem, however, was that when it was traveling six miles via aqueduct in the hot sun, by the time it actually reached Laodicea, it started off as cold up there in Denisia. By the time it arrived in Laodicea, it was tepid, lukewarm, which helps us understand some of what Jesus is going to say to this church in terms of their spiritual health. This created a dangerous situation for the city if it was besieged. Militarily, it had very little value. It had great commercial value because it was located at the crossroads of trade. But it had very little military value, and it was actually vulnerable in the event that it was besieged because all you needed to do was to cut off the water supply, and the city would have to surrender. The only way for Laodicea to prosper was if there was peace in the world. And we know that there wasn't often peace in this world until the Romans arrived. And when the Romans arrived, they established what became known as the famed Pax Romana. And when that happened, Laodicea took off like a rocket. It became a very wealthy and prosperous city. It became a banking and financial center. Cicero actually writes about cashing letters of credit there. And I mentioned that before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that a number of these cities, uh, because of where they were located in an area of volcanic activity, were oftentimes devastated by earthquakes. Uh, and it was only by means of imperial subsidy that they were able to rebuild. While that was the case with Laodicea, it had been destroyed at an earlier time by an earthquake. The empire had come in and helped to rebuild it. But then in the year 61 AD, they were devastated by another earthquake that practically leveled the city. And this is just a short time before John delivers this letter to the church in Laodicea. But on that occasion, when the empire offered them a subsidy to rebuild, the people were so wealthy and they felt so self-sufficient and so prideful that they refused the imperial subsidy and completely rebuilt the city on their own. They were that wealthy. And it made a big imprint. Uh, Tacitus, in his annals, writes about this. He said, one of the most famous cities of Asia, Laodicea, was in that same year overthrown by an earthquake and without any relief from us, recovered itself by its own resources. So this was a city that had become very affluent, very influential, and these people regarded themselves as being self sufficient. It also became a center for the textile industry. It was famous for its sheep, which it um, would raise there. They had a very glossy and black kind of uh, fur, and uh, it was used to make tunics and all kinds of garments that were exported throughout uh, the ancient world. So they were known for their textile industry as well as their banking industry. They were renowned also as a great medical 
facility. Uh, they developed something there, ointments for ear infections and for eye infections. They called it Phrygian powder. Today we call it collyrium. And it too was exported all throughout the Roman Empire and apparently was pretty effective in treating eye infections and ear infections and so forth. But of course the thing that it was most famous for was for its money. It was a place where millionaires, or we would call them today billionaires, lived. The wealthiest people in Asia lived in Laodicea. It was really the, the highest of the high. A church was established here in Laodicea, probably during Paul's time in Ephesus, as was the case with most of these churches throughout Asia. Paul never visited there as far as we know, but he nevertheless considered it as being within his sphere of apostolic authority. And we know that because he mentions the church in Laodicea in his letter to the Colossians. Paul says, give greetings to the brothers in Laodicea. And he also wrote a letter to this church. Now, the letter has been lost to history. We don't know what happened to it, but Paul makes mention of it in his letters to the Colossians. And some scholars believe that it is actually what we call the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, some scholars believe that the letter to the Ephesians was actually a circular letter that was intended for a number of churches here in Asia. And we just have the copy that has Ephesus written on the top that Paul wrote a circular letter, and one would have been addressed to Laodicea, one would have been addressed to Ephesus, and so forth. And we simply got the Ephesian letter. So some people believe that the letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea is the same letter that we have to the Ephesians. So there was a church there in this wealthy city. The church grew up quickly as the city prospered. But by the time that John receives this revelation, by the time that Jesus is speaking to these churches, this is a church that has fallen on evil days. It has fallen on evil days. As I said, this is the sternest of all the letters, not a single word of praise for this church. There were problems in Ephesus. Yes, they had forgotten their first love, but they were still engaged in ministry. They were still faithful. They were still being true to the gospel. But in the case of Laodicea, Jesus has no praise at all. As a matter of fact, what Jesus said is that this is a church that makes him sick. He said it is a church that he is prepared to spit out of his mouth. Now we ask the question, what was the problem in the Laodicean church? My goodness, well, this is a severe critique by Jesus. What is the problem? Well, it's interesting, and we read through this particular section, we don't find any particular sin or heresy. Now we had problems in the other churches. There were people who were engaged in sexual immorality, some of them, and they had failed to discipline them. There's a reference to false teaching, people like the teachings of Balaam or uh, the teachings of Jezebel. There's no specific reference to any kind of sin or heresy here. There's no mention of any particular heretic or leader within the church who was corrupting the people by their teaching. No, the problem here in this church seems to be, as I said, this tepid attitude when it came to Jesus and the things of the faith. I know your works, verse 15, you are neither cold nor hot, would that you were either cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. How many of you like to drink hot tea? Let's put your hands up so we can see them. Hot tea. How many of you like iced tea? How many of you like Lukewarm tea. No. Ah, you see, you get the idea, don't you? Nobody likes anything that's lukewarm. Here's what's interesting. Jesus said, I would prefer that you were hot. Like that church in Smyrna, that church was white hot with the gospel, ready to suffer for the sake of Christ. Or he says, I wish you were cold, cold as a corpse. Because you see, with a hot church, you can do something. Even with a cold church, there's the hope of resurrection. <laughs> but what can you do with a tepid church? You can't do very much of anything with a tepid church. John Stott put it this way. He said, perhaps none of the seven letters is more appropriate to the church of the 21st century than this. It describes vividly the respectable 
nominal, rather sentimental, skin-deep religiosity which is so widespread among us today. Our Christianity is flabby and anemic. We appear to have taken a lukewarm bath of religion. Of all the churches, he says, perhaps the church of today is most like the church in Laodicea, the church about which Jesus has nothing good to say, the church about which he says it actually makes him sick. Jesus, as I said, would have preferred that we be hot or cold. It's a great promise for the hot church. There's even hope for the cold church, but a lukewarm church is worthless. John Bunyan, in his story, Pilgrim's Progress, has wonderful characters like Miss Busywork. And one of the characters in that book is Mr. Facing Both Ways. <laughs> it's a vivid picture, isn't it? Mr. Facing Both Ways. That's a picture of this church in Laodicea. They didn't stand for anything. They weren't being persecuted like the church in Smyrna because they weren't standing for anything. They had so accommodated themselves to the culture that they weren't regarded as any kind of a threat. Is that the case with many churches today? Sort of going along to get along? These were wealthy people. But Jesus has something to say to them. First of all, he says they claim to be rich, but they are in fact poor. He says, I know your works. You say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. You rebuilt your city by means of your own resources. But I say to you, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Cotton Mather was one of the great divines of the 17th century. He's one of those people that has fallen on hard times. The only thing that we remember Cotton Mather for today is the fact that he presided over the Salem witch trials. But actually, he was a great minister, a great Puritan preacher of the gospel. And one of the things that Cotton Mather said was this. He said, wherever Christianity has gone throughout the world, it has always left people better than they were before. And if you think about it, history bears this out. Wherever the Christian gospel has gone, it has always raised people to an entirely new level. It's always left them affluent. But then he said this. He said, while Christianity breeds affluence, he said, then the daughter devours the mother. Christianity has gone out. It raises people to an altogether new level. They become affluent, but then that affluence actually devours the faithfulness. Now he wrote those words in the 17th century. Imagine what he would say if you could transport him forward to the 21st century. The daughter devours the mother. That seems to be the main problem for the church in Laodicea. They were so wealthy, so affluent, that they simply did not feel their need for God. They didn't feel their need for anybody. They regarded themselves as self-sufficient. And this seems to be the primary critique that Jesus has against this church. You'll notice that this is a continuous refrain in Jesus' ministry. Keep your finger there in Revelation for just a moment and turn, if you will, to Luke's Gospel. We're going to spend just a little bit of time there in Luke's Gospel. But Jesus, as I said, talks about this subject over and over again, and it is one that we in particular need to hear. Now, let me ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. How many of you regard yourselves as affluent? Oh, boy, you all better get your hands up in the air. Compared to the vast majority of the world... And I'm sure George Green can testify to this because he's seen people living in abject poverty in other parts of the world. You and I are among the most affluent people in the world. How many of you are going hungry today? How many of you are not going to have a roof over your, over your head today? How many of you have to worry about clothing? <laughs> Probably the problem is you get up in the morning and you wonder, what am I going to wear today? We are an affluent people, and we need to come to terms with that. I'm not asking if you are affluent compared to Donald Trump or affluent compared to Bill Gates 
I'm asking you, are you affluent compared to the vast majority of the world's population? And my friends, you are wildly, extravagantly affluent. And that is why we desperately need to hear what Jesus has to say about this whole issue of affluence. Because that was the problem for the church in Laodicea. It was their affluence. So Jesus tells the story. Look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 and following. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades, being in torment. And he lifted up his eyes and saw Abram far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have brothers, five brothers, so that they, he may warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, that's a picture. It's a message about the resurrection, but it's also a picture about caring for the needs of the poor, isn't it? Here's this wealthy man. He feasts sumptuously. He cares not for those who are what? Just at his very gate in desperation and need. And one dies... The one who had everything in this life, and where does he end up? In Hades. And the one who had nothing in this life dies and ends up where? In paradise. That is a powerful message. It is a powerful message. Take a look at Luke chapter 12 for just a moment. This one's even more straightforward. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I want you to get this picture in your mind. Jesus is out there teaching the crowd, and you've been in a classroom, you've seen somebody, there's always somebody in the back, ra raising their hand, call on me, I've, I've got a question, and so you call on them, and this person says, teacher, I got a problem. Now you can just imagine Jesus is saying, well, I'm in the middle of a teaching, I understand teacher, but this is serious. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Boy, is that a damning statement. We live in a culture in which most people have been taught to believe that the one who dies with the most toys wins. And Jesus said, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Retire. That's not in there, but it's the idea. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that Jesus tells us we're not supposed to say is that somebody is a fool. There are only a handful of places in all of Scripture where God calls an individual a fool. But this man is called a fool. Why? Because he stores up stuff for himself in this life. Stuff. You've heard me say this before. We, we, we spend our whole lives 
acquiring stuff, don't we? And then we die. And our children don't know what to do with all our stuff. And most of them do what? Give away all our stuff. Jesus said that really is a foolish, foolish thing to do. To think that life is all about possessions. There's a lot more that we could say. Jesus tells the story of the widow's offering. You know the story. Jesus and the disciples are standing there in the temple watching people come up. In those days, there was no such thing as paper currency. Everything had to be paid in coins. And when you paid your offering, we've got those nice little velvet discs in the bottom of the offering plates here at St. Philip. But in those days, you had these huge trumpet-shaped containers in the temple. And you went up and you dropped your coins and you could hear the coins rattle the whole way down to the bottom. And, of course, the rich would come up, and the more money you had, the larger the coins, and they would drop them in, and you could hear the, the clattering. It sounded like for two minutes. And then there came this widow, and she had what was called a mite in the old King James Version. It was the fraction of a penny, and it was such a small coin. I actually have, a, I actually have one of these widow's mites, and it is so small that when she dropped it in, it made no sound at all. And the disciples are sitting there. Of course, they're just common fishermen. And, and, and they look and they see the wealthy coming up and dropping in their coins and they can hear all that rattling and they're just so impressed. Wow, he, he gave a lot. And she even gave more than that. Can you believe it? And then the widow comes up and she drops in her coin and nobody even notices. But Jesus draws their attention to her and he says, I tell you the truth, that widow has put in more than all the rest combined. For they gave out of their affluence their abundance. She gave everything that she had. What impresses the disciples is not what impresses Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting to you that wealth and money are necessarily bad things. Being rich is not a sin. It's an economic condition. But what I am saying and what Jesus is saying very clearly is that being affluent, having possessions, having money is a spiritual liability. There is nothing that can so pull you away from a relationship with Christ as money. I can tell you as a pastor, I've seen this tear families apart. Every now and then you'll get a family that will fall apart because somebody becomes a Christian and the rest are not. But the vast majority of families that fall apart, fall apart over money. Somebody dies and the big fight is about who's going to get what. I've seen them fight over furniture for Pete's sakes. Well, she, and she, she got the sideboard and that's what I wanted. And I haven't spoken to her for 15 years as a consequence. Now you're all shaking your heads because you know this is true. And this is what Jesus is warning us about Jesus talks about a rich young man. This is perhaps one of the most powerful of all Jesus' teaching on this subject. Look at Matthew chapter 19 for just a moment. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And the young man said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear falsehood, and honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus rehearses the Ten Commandments. And the young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now, we hear somebody say that, I've kept all the commandments, and we think to ourselves, what a self-righteous person. Who does he think he is? But what is interesting is I think this man really believed it. He impresses the disciples because at the end, Peter turns to Jesus and said, if he can't be saved, who can? If he can't be saved, what, what hope is there for me? I think this man really did, to the best of his ability at least, try to keep the Ten Commandments. I think he cared for his father and his mother. I think he was faithful in his worship. I think he did all of the things that Jesus said that he needed to do. And Jesus said, well, there's only one thing that you need then. One thing to inherit eternal life. Here, here it is. 
Go and sell all that you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, verse 22, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of God. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Here was a man who believed that he had kept all of the commandments. But Jesus knew that he'd actually broken the very first And having broken the very first commandment, he had broken all the rest as a consequence. What's the first commandment? You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before him. You want to know if you have other gods? What is first in your life? What is the most important thing in your life? The thing about which, if you you lost it, all of your joy would be gone. Whatever that is, that is your God. And for many people, if they were to lose their possessions, if they were to lose their money, their bank account, their investments, if the stock market were to crash, they would lose everything that would feel as a complete failure, and they'd give it up. That's what Jesus was warning these people about. And that's why he says, store not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's interesting, the heart follows the treasure, not the other way around. Let me ask you a question. You've already heard this before, but... When you die, how much are you going to leave behind? All of it. There's an old proverb that says, there are no pockets in a burial shroud. We're going to leave it all behind. Now, as Christians, we have a great opportunity. We can leave it all behind or we can send it on ahead. And by that, I mean we can invest it for the sake of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about here in this passage. And that was the problem for the church in Laodicea. They had everything that money could buy. They didn't need anybody. They didn't feel their need for God like that man in Jesus' parable. He ate it sumptuously. He didn't feel his need for God. Anything he needed, he could get for himself. But Jesus said because they were so wealthy and so obsessed with money and so self-sufficient, because they didn't feel their need for God, in spite of their wealth, they were in fact wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They possessed everything and yet possessed nothing. Now what hope is there for a church like that? Well, it reminds me of that scene out of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. When Ebenezer Scrooge is first visited by Jacob Marley, his old partner. You remember they had been partners in that counting house together, and Jacob Marley comes and he confronts his old partner and tells him that he's making a great chain. He's been forging it link by link. And there's a point where he says, you're going to be visited by three ghosts. And Scrooge says, I'd rather not. Marley says, tough, this is the way it's going to be. And, And at one point, Scrooge looks at Marley and he says, Marley, speak words of comfort to me. Speak words of comfort to me. And Marley says, I have none to give. But I leave you with just the tiniest, chance of redemption. That is what Jesus says to this church. They are pitiable, poor, wretched, blind, naked. They made salve for ear infections, but they themselves were sick. 
And they made Jesus sick to the point where he was willing to spit them out. But here's the important point. He hadn't spit them out yet. And still there's hope for them. Here's Jesus' advice to this church. If we are like that today, this is Jesus' advice to us. What does he say? Go back to Revelation. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Gold is often in the Bible a picture of righteousness. Clothe yourself, not in fine raiments, Jesus says, clothe yourself in the righteousness that comes from the gospel. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Jesus said, clothe yourself in that which really will hide your nakedness, the righteousness of Christ. We have a wonderful hymn, How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord, that has that in. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume, and what? Thy gold to refine. That's what Jesus says to these people. Be concerned about that which truly clothes your nakedness. Buy white garments to clothe yourselves. White garments are a symbol of purity. You put on Christ's righteousness, but then you begin to live a pure life after the manner of Jesus Christ. Jesus told a parable on one occasion about a wedding feast. He said he invited a number of people to the wedding feast. The king did. And many people made excuses as to why they couldn't come. Now, you have to understand, this is the king. It's for his son, but the people refuse to come. They make all kinds of excuses, and so the king decides to go out and invite anybody in. He goes, says, go out into the highways and into the alleys and the, and the corners and find the people and invite them in so that my house may be filled. And we're told that all the people came in and they were all filled, but there was one person, listen to this, who was not properly attired. And when they found that person and he wasn't properly attired, what did they do? The king said, bind him hand and foot and throw him out the door into the outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, when you listen to that parable, you think to yourself, gee, he's inviting these people in from the street to come in and fill the house. And they come in and lo and behold, they, they come and they don't have the right clothes and he throws them out. What you don't understand is that in the ancient world, when you came to a wedding feast, if you were invited and you didn't have the proper attire, it was the responsibility of your host to provide it. What that parable is really saying is that these people were invited in, their host was prepared to clothe them, but there was one man who refused to wear the garment that was provided for him. He wanted to come just as he was, and as a consequence, he gets bound and thrown out. Jesus Christ offers an invitation to us to come and be a part of his wedding feast, and he promises to provide us with the garment that is necessary to be accepted, the garment of his own righteousness, but there are some people who refuse to wear it. He says, get salve for your eyes. You make that Phrygian powder, calyrium. You can heal people physically, he said, but your eyes are blinded. You need the grace of God. How did John Newton put it? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Well, how were the Laodiceans to get to that point? Two things. They were to be zealous in their repentance. We're going to talk about that in church today in the sermon If they were ever going to be changed and ever going to be saved, if they were going to be raised from their self-satisfied condition, camels trying to inch their way through the eye of a needle, if they were ever going to change from that, they needed to be zealous about repentance. And they needed to open the door that they had shut. By our wealth, by our affluence, my friends, we can shut Jesus Christ out. There's a lot more that I wanted to say here about this, but I'm going to close with just one story. That painting, and if you ever go to London, 
make a point of going to St. Paul's Cathedral to see that, the light of the world, Jesus knocking on the door. And there was a father who was standing in front of that painting. They have a little chapel there. You can sit there and you can meditate on the painting. There was a father who was standing there holding his little girl's hand. She was only about six years old, and they were looking at it. And there's a little placard there that explains what the painting is all about. And the father is explaining that this is a picture of the church in Laodicea. This is the church that had locked the door and so forth. And he's explaining it to his little girl so she understands. And she just stands there and just peers at this painting. And she's silent for a long time. And finally he looks down at her and he says, Honey, are you all right? And the little girl looks up and she said, Did he ever get in? And the father said, what? And the little girl said, they closed him out. He stood at the door and knocked. Did he ever get in? That's the question, isn't it? We so often close the door. Jesus Christ is locked out. This was a church that was affluent. It must have had impressive buildings. It must have had all kinds of programs going on. It probably had lots of people in the pew. But Jesus was not impressed with it. Why? Because by their affluence, their self-sufficiency, they had closed the door and locked him out. And the one who was their master and Lord was on the outside knocking, begging to get in. Is that a picture of us? When we come back next week, we're going to take a look just briefly at all seven of these churches. We said that the purpose of studying these seven churches is that they be a diagnostic tool for us. That we be given the opportunity as the people of St. Philip's to ask ourselves, which one of these churches are we? Somebody sent me a note this week thanking me for this lecture on Revelation. And one of the things this person said is, I'm not sure which church we are. Well, that's what we need to figure out. And it may be, we may discover that we're a combination of all of these churches. And if that's the case, what do we do about it? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. Uh, it is a hard message, this message that Jesus gave to the church in Laodicea, a church that was neither hot nor cold, just lukewarm, really didn't stand for anything, and probably fell for everything. Grant us the grace, Lord, not to be like this. If we have locked you out of our lives individually, if we have locked you out of our life corporately, Lord, we pray that you would give us ears to hear, that we might hear you knocking, and that we might set aside all these other things and open the door and lay our treasures at your feet. For you are the true king, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.